Imagine what would happen if you left a type of bird, for example finches, alone on a lush planet without predators for hundreds of millions of years. What kinds of incredible forms of life might evolve? If you consider that mammals grew from a few rodent-like species into elephants, whales, horses, bats, and primates in a much shorter period after the extinction of the dinosaurs, you'll start to realize just how incredible things might get. This concept is the idea behind one of the most detailed speculative biology projects ever created, Serena, the world of birds. This epic multi-million year journey was created by Dylan Beta, an incredible artist and writer, and I have links below where you can follow and support his work. There's so much incredible detail to this project, and I won't be able to cover it all in a single video. But for now, let's get started at the very beginning of the saga with the introduction of life to the moon of Serena. The story begins when some force, perhaps aliens or advanced humans, places Earth lifeforms on the moon of Serena. Specifically, they put canaries into a terraformed ecosystem much like Earth's. A few other species, including grasses, algae, flowering plants like sunflowers, tiny fish like guppies and swordtails, and insects like ants and crickets, are also left on the planet to create a sustainable food source for the finches, which are the only significant land animals on this entire moon. And then the creators of this mysterious experiment depart, and evolution takes over. The explosion in canary diversity is almost instantaneous. The artist speculates that lacking predators and with a near endless food supply, the population would skyrocket over the first 10,000 years. From here, early specialization emerges, with insect eaters, plant eaters, egg eaters, and seed eaters all becoming subtly different over the generations. In the sea, guppies and swordtails grow and diversify. Over the next several million years, this period, which is called the Hypostocene, sees small fish become larger and more streamlined, with hydrodynamics shaping them into familiar forms. Several million years in, and leafcutter ants have quickly proliferated, with their numbers reaching tens of billions. Soon, larger, flightless variants of canaries emerge to feed on this growing food source. As the sun rises 10 million years into this grand experiment, a truly diverse ecosystem of different species is forming. Here, the thick-beaked axebills strut across the plains, near the large wamblers and long-legged ard geese. Already, the moon of Serena is a much different place from when these birds first arrive, and from here things will only get stranger. 11 million years in, an era called the Tempocene begins, marked by a steady cooling and an increase in arid environments. A region called the Northern Drylands comprises the largest temperate desert region on this moon, where all sorts of new species are emerging. It's now early spring here, and a large and lithe Ardgoost offshoot is strutting across the drylands, keeping an eye on fearsome descendants of the formerly herbivorous axebills called the skikes, which are now sharp-billed omnivores. Nearby, one of the first true predators on Serena, the small falconary, hunts a songbird under the branches of huge, tree-like sunflower descendants. But below them all, in a series of tunnels, an even more interesting dynamic is unfolding. These tunnels are made by an enormous lobster-like arthropod, which despite weighing as much as a small cat, is in fact a cricket. And with it in its home are strange little birds called ground sarens. They can't dig tunnels themselves, but make use of the friendly cricket's burrow to keep themselves safe, and in return act as lookouts. A very strange set of roommates indeed. As the Tempocenic era progresses, Serena continues to cool. In this changing environment, the artist imagines one successful branch of art geese, called the Vivas, is on the path to a surprising yet useful adaptation, the birth of live young without requiring an egg. And in the coming ice age, this adaptation will prove vital to the branch's success. Away from the mainland, however, the isolated Cryan Islands are not yet feeling the effects of the global cooling. Indeed, on these islands where food grows in abundance and predators are scarce, very different selective pressures are creating some of the largest, and strangest, species of birds so far. Reaching heights of over 10 feet, or 3 meters, the chub birds are huge offshoots of finches that don't resemble any other birds on Serena at this time. In this paradise, there's simply nothing big enough on these islands to bother them. 
In time, though, the islands change, the chub birds pass on, and in their place, an even stranger species of megafauna emerge. These are the snuffalos, shaggy, heavy set creatures almost the size of cattle, and with similar grazing behavior. The snuffalos are so heavy, however, that they can't support their weight on their two feet alone and must also rely on their beak for balance, which has almost become a third foot. Inefficient? Perhaps, but there are few predators on these islands that would make the snuffalo require speed. Save perhaps for one. The butcher raptor is an evolutionary newcomer and not large enough to seem like a threat to something snuffalo sized. But the butcher raptor has something the snuffalo does not intelligence. Butcher raptors are quite possibly the smartest creatures Serena has yet to produce, efficient pack hunters that can, in a group, take down something as big as a snuffalo. And in the oceans, life is also diversifying into unexpected forms. Take for example the sword sharks, predators whose sword tail ancestors average 6 inches in length. The sword shark, in contrast, averages up to 8 feet and preys on vast shoals of smaller fish, thrashing them with their unique tails to stun them. An even more incredible transformation has occurred in the case of the giant Gemnus, a guest entry into Serena conceptualized by Joseph Cawley. The giant Gemnus grows over 30 feet or 9 meters in length and consumes over 400 pounds or 180 kilos of plant matter a day. And yet the ancestors of these herbivorous behemoths are the tiny guppies. Truly aquatic birds called bloons also emerged during the Tempocene, like the starry pelicarrier, a species that incubates eggs under its hind legs and carries its young safely in its mouth. Right now, these early seafaring birds are far from the largest things in the ocean, about the size of a human diver. In the future, however, the circumstances for the bloons would change. However, it's not the balloons, nor even the giant gemnus that one should be keeping an eye on long term. These tiny, unfortunate, almost toad looking creatures are called mud wickets. They're a species of fish that lives in tidal areas and are beginning the process of crawling onto land. Right now, they're not up to much, but there are many millions of years to go in our great epic. Looking back on Serena's progress, 50 million years have now passed since the introduction of the Canaries, and the moon is now entering a period called the Cryocene. The climate, already cooling in the Tempocene, has now cooled further, and over half the moon's surface is locked in ice. In this new frontier, the live-bearing vivas groups have come to dominate all manner of niches, both at the equator and in the colder regions. From large tropical shimmer snoot vivas who eat insects with their long tongues, to the lithe herbivorous serolopes and thick-beaked carnivorous banshees of the plains, to the tiny bumblets who burrow underground to keep warm, the vivas have become one of the most diverse groups in this new world. Another successful vivas is the Canaribou, large, thick-coated offshoots of serolopes that live in enormous migratory herds and can withstand the harsh polar winters of this region. The Canaribou is the first true live-bearing bird, giving birth to fully hatched infants. Here, a mother protects its newborn from a giant falconary, aerial predators that have grown gigantic over the ages but are not so large they're ready to tangle with an angry mother protecting its young. In the tall forests of pine flowers, plants which have evolved conifer-like needles, the more familiar descendants of egg-laying species hold on. In this more temperate region, the giant flightless anvil beak, with a beak that helps it crack open all manner of seeds, lives near its cousins, the swordbills, who are lightweight hunters. These holdovers are distant descendants of the axebills, and in these forests, their lineage will endure despite the dropping temperatures. Another familiar, though increasingly strange species are the mole birds, the descendants of the burrowing finches who are now capable diggers in their own right. For millions of years, they've quietly tunneled underground, content to be ignored by the above-ground megafauna. Also much changed since our last visit are the aquatic balloons, which are now one of the most specialized lineages of birds on Serena. Growing to more than 60 feet, or 18 meters in length, and weighing up to 15,000 pounds, or 6,800 kilograms, this is a family of gentle herbivorous leviathans, which the artist describes as the largest birds that have ever existed. Existed. And at the water's edge, the unassuming mud wickets have continued to adapt, spending more and more time on land. They still don't look like much, but soon circumstances will change. 
But the time of the mud wickets is not yet upon us. Jumping forwards to the late Cryocene, the final period we'll be covering in this particular video, we've arrived at an age of giants. On the plains, one large offshoot of the Serolope are the Flutterbox, colorful herbivores with a bright plumage similar in many ways to the feathers of Earth's peacocks. The Flutterbox are in turn stalked by the dinosaur-like trunk snouts, whose newly evolved pseudoteeth make them effective predators with a high degree of evolutionary potential. Even more dinosaur-like are the Cerastriders the largest terrestrial bird that is yet to evolve on Serena. Exceeding 12 meters or 40 feet in height and weighing several tons, the Cerastriders are the sauropods of their day, adapted to browse the highest branches of trees. But larger herbivores mean larger carnivores. The tyrant Serens, the grandest of all descendants of the distant axe-bill, are apex predators that can take down other large megafauna. Equipped with serrated beaks able to shatter bone, these tyrants are the heaviest land predators yet to evolve. This period is an early peak of megafauna on Serena, which now supports species so large and distinct they're almost unrecognizable when one reflects on the moon's first humble inhabitants. Over the next several million years, Serena would change once again, as an increase in volcanic eruptions on a larger scale than ever before would turn the environment on its head, giving rise to far more alien-looking creatures than what we've seen so far, which we'll explore in our next installment. But for now, that's all the time we have. If you enjoyed learning about the moon of Serena, consider supporting and following Dylan Beta using the links below. Also, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this entry, please lend your support, and like, subscribe, and hit the notification icon to stay up to date on all things curious. See you in the next video.